welcome to the christening ceremony for the aircraft carrier George H.W. Bush, CVN 77. For the enjoyment of everyone, we request that you please turn off all cell phones and pagers. Now, please stand as the official platform party takes its place on the dais. Captain Kevin E. O'Flaherty, Prospecting Commanding Officer, Pre-Commissioning Unit for the Aircraft Carrier George H. W. Bush, CVN 77. Rear Admiral David Archisel, Program Executive Officer for Aircraft Carriers. <laughs> Vice Admiral Paul E. Sullivan, Commander, Naval, ne Naval Sea Systems Command. <laughs> Admiral Kirk Donald, Director, Naval Nuclear Propulsion. The Honorable C.W. Bill Young, United States House of Representatives, 10th Congressional District, Florida. <laughs> Captain Jonathan M. Frusty, Chaplain and Executive Director, Armed Forces Chaplains Board. <laughs> Captain Michael E. McMahon, U.S. Navy Commanding Officer, Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Conversion and Repair, Newport News. Vice Admiral James M. Zortman, Commander, Naval Air Forces Commander, Naval Air Forces, U.S. Pacific Fleet. <laughs> the Honorable Dolores M. Etter, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition. <laughs> the Honorable Andrew Crenshaw, United States House of Representatives, 4th Congressional District, Florida. <laughs> the Honorable Thelma Drake, United States House of Representatives, 2nd Congressional District, Virginia. The Honorable Bobby Scott, United States House of Representatives, 3rd Congressional District, Virginia. The Honorable Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice of the United States. Mrs. Patricia Riley Cook, Matron of Honor. Mrs. Georgia, Miss Georgia Grace Cook, Maid of Honor. Miss Nancy Ellis LeBlonde, Maid of Honor. The Honorable John Ellis Bush, Governor of the State of Florida. Admiral Michael G. Mullen, Chief of Naval Operations. The Honorable Donald C. Winter, Secretary of the Navy. The Honorable John Warner, United States Senator, Virginia. The Honorable Donald H. Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense. The Honorable Tim Kaine, Governor, Commonwealth of Virginia. Dr. Ron Sugar, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Northrop Grumman Corporation. General Peter Pace, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Honorable George Allen, United States Senator, Virginia. Accompanied by Northrop Grumman Newport News President Mike Petters, please welcome our ship sponsor, Mrs. Doro Bush Cook. United States, George H.W. Bush and Mrs. Barbara Bush.
the President of the United States and Mrs. Laura Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the posting of the colors by the Commander Navy Region Mid-Atlantic Color Guard, followed by the National Anthem by the United States Fleet Forces Band, and then the invocation delivered by Captain Jonathan Frusty. We join our hearts together in prayer. All powerful and all merciful God, you whom in our heart of hearts we seek, grant to us the grace of your presence this day. Today we celebrate. We celebrate the momentous occasion of a time-honored tradition, the christening of a ship. And in the occasion of that christening, we recognize too those who have had a hand in her conception and construction. We thank you for those whose skills have brought us to the celebration of this day and pray your continued blessings upon them. Bless too the continued efforts of their hands, that the steel and the aluminum used in the making of this ship 
might become, in turn, a living vessel, a vessel given life through the infusion of those whose turn it will be to take her to sea. Bless the servicemen and women now assigned and those who will one day join them. Grant to each of them a courage and strength that finds its source, purpose, and being in you. Bless their efforts extended on behalf of the peoples of our land and freedom-loving peoples everywhere. Bless our leadership with a wisdom and a character to know how ours best to utilize the forces entrusted to its care to include the utilization of this great vessel and grant to us as a people a unity of purpose that the peoples of the world might well be served through our efforts. On this day, as we christen the George H.W. Bush, we pray that the ship and its crew might bring the honor of its namesake to the country it serves. In those ideals, O oh God, bless its every effort with success toward the end that a world might be created in which peace and justice prevail. Bless the relationship between sponsor and ship, ship and namesake, and namesake and history. Lord, long after the youngest here has turned gray with age, may this vessel bring accolade to those who built it, honor to those who sailed it, and tribute to the ideals of service embodied in its namesake. May it enjoy a long and illustrious career reputed to have served its country and its country's ideals well. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us and grant us peace. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Mr. Mike Petters, President, Northrop Grumman, Newport News. Well, good morning. Mr. President and Mrs. Bush, President and Mrs. George H.W. Bush, Mrs. Cook, Governor Kane, Senator Warner and Senator Allen, Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary Winter, General Pace, Admiral Mullen, Dr. Sugar, and all our distinguished platform guests, to the entire Bush family and many friends, and to everyone here today, on behalf of the 19,000 shipbuilders of Northrop Grumman Newport News, we welcome you to the birthplace of America's nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. This is a great day, and it is a great day to be a shipbuilder, as we christen the George H.W. Bush, the final ship of the Nimitz class of aircraft carriers. We have so many special guests, and you'll hear from some of them during the ceremony. But first, I want to recognize a few people in our audience. If they could please stand as I call their names. First, join me in welcoming Mr. Alton Glass, President, United Steelworkers Local 8888, Mr. James Allen, President, Security F Police Fire Professionals of America Local 451, and Mr. William Haraday, National Representative, United Steelworkers. I would also like to recognize two gentlemen who, as co-chairman of the Aircraft Carrier Industrial Base Coalition, represent the thousands of aircraft carrier suppliers throughout America. Would Rick Giannini and Jerry Wilson please stand? We are so excited about today's ceremony. The shipbuilders here at Newport News have a very special bond with the Bush family. Five years ago, President George W. Bush was here with Mrs. Nancy Reagan as she christened the ship named after her husband, the former President Ronald Reagan. The First Lady, Laura Bush, christened the submarine USS Texas a few years ago on a very hot July day. In 1981, Barbara Bush christened the submarine USS Houston, and in 1990, she christened the carrier USS George Washington. Then President George H.W. Bush gave the keynote address. Barbara's matron of honor that day was her daughter, Doro. And today, Doro officially steps into the role that her mother so wonderfully performed here not once, but twice. 
And of course, both the 41st and the 43rd president have ordered many of the ships built here into action. Ask any shipbuilder and they will tell you that each ship of a class takes on a unique personality. And that is certainly the case with this carrier named George H.W. Bush. The life of this ship's namesake has paralleled and intersected the history of naval aviation like no one else's. It's a life of service to country, dedication to family, and one lived with steadfast integrity. Search all you want for a better name to paint on this ship, but you will search in vain. President Bush, let me tell you a bit about the people who are building your ship. Collis P. Huntington, the founder of this shipyard, intended that the ships built here, quote, be a credit to our country as well as to ourselves, unquote. Our workers live by that creed today as they have since 1886, generations of them. For many of the shipbuilders with us today are the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of shipbuilders who, for more than 100 years in this very yard, have done the work of translating America's best intentions into action. They do this work day in and day out in blistering heat and freezing cold and in the rain. It is dangerous work. It is difficult and demanding work. And it is noble work. Would all of the shipbuilders of Northrop Grumman please stand? For 120 years, the ships built here, like their builders, have rendered years of faithful service. Some of those ships still serve today, and some met valiant ends in distant oceans in defense of our liberties. Wood has given way to iron and iron to steel. We have moved from coal to oil and from oil to atoms. But every ship built here has proven a credit to our nation and to the proud people who build them. I know that this mighty ship, George H.W. Bush, will follow in that tradition. Thank you. Our first guest speaker is the 70th Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Previous service includes four terms on the Richmond City Council before he was elected Lieutenant Governor of Virginia in 2001. A Kansas City native, he graduated from the University of Missouri and received his law degree from Harvard. Please welcome the Governor of Virginia, the Honorable Tim Kaine. Mr. President, President Bush Sr. and all members of the Bush family, and to all of you distinguished guests and friends, welcome to Virginia and to the greatest shipyard in the world. This wonderful event this day fuses two very powerful Virginia traditions, ships and shipbuilding, and the intense patriotism and commitment that Virginians have felt since the beginning of our Commonwealth in serving this nation. And there is no finer person for those two con uh, conditions to come together to honor than President Bush Sr. We are so proud that this ship will carry your name. Your service, serving the country during World War II, your long career in public service as a congressman, ambassador, vice president, and president, your humanitarian service to the world do make this so very fitting today. You prayed and often talked when you were president of the need that our country and our world be kinder and gentler. And your name on this ship will forever remind us that a world that's kinder and gentler depends upon that good people and good nations have force and wisdom in the use of that force. Congratulations, Mr. President, on this wonderful day, and we're so proud to share it with you. It's now my honor to introduce a good friend. Dr. Ronald Sugar is the chairman of the board 
and the Chief Executive Officer of Northrop Grumman Corporation, one of the world's top defense companies, and a leader in using technology to transform our military, Northrop Grumman is also the largest private employer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Northrop Grumman used to be known primarily for its work on military aircraft, but now is involved in significant and diverse defense sectors, and today is the largest shipbuilder in this nation. Under the leadership of Ron Sugar, Northrop Grumman remains a key partner for progress for Virginia and for the nation and world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ron Sugar. Thank you, Governor Kane, for that wonderful introduction. President and Mrs. Bush, President and Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Cook, and all the distinguished guests that are here with us today. What a glorious day this is. Today we christen a great ship with a great namesake. She was built by people of pride and dedication, much like the crews who will man her. The United States Navy has always drawn such Americans to the ensign, Americans who answer the highest calling, the profession of arms in defense of a free nation. It is the highest calling because in our dangerous world, it makes all other callings possible. On behalf of all the 120,000 employees of our company, I declare it a privilege and honor to serve those who serve our nation. Our company's relationship with the United States Navy is a long one. Over 100 years ago, this shipyard built much of Teddy Roosevelt's great white fleet. The Grumman Iron Works built the aircraft that you, Mr. President, flew off the deck of the USS San Jacinto in World War II. We built the Navy's C-2 Cod, the E-2 Hawkeye, and the F-14 Tomcat. And today, we're helping to build the F-18s and F-35s that will be the teeth of this new ship. Our people are proud to be the Navy's manufacturer, but they are even prouder to be the Navy's partner. The ships that we build today will carry young Americans into battle tomorrow. Look around, and you will see fellow Americans in the uniforms of our country. For them, honor, duty, and responsibility are not quaint notions. They are matters of life and death. These Americans are, at their core, idealists. And these idealists are our partners. For the next half century, wherever this great ship sails, we will continue to serve you who answer this highest of callings. We will sometimes be with you in person. We will always be with you in spirit. We will admire your exploits, and we will take pride in the tools that you use to safeguard our lives and our liberties. So the best of luck to this ship and to all Americans who will serve honor today and in the future. Thank you. I would like now to introduce to you a great legislator, a great Virginian, and a great American. He is a former governor of this Commonwealth and a lifelong friend of the United States Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce United States Senator George Allen. Thank you, Dr. Sugar, for that very kind and generous introduction. And I have been, for many years, visiting this shipyard, seeing the work that is being done on this carrier. It all looks so wonderful now, but if you see all the details and all the positioning and all the work that goes into it, you lead a wonderful team here of very uniquely talented men and women who have dedicated their lives to the shipyard. In fact, it's a legacy that has actually gone on in many cases for generations. And so I thank you, Dr. Sugar. I thank Mike Petters and the whole team here at, at Northrop Grumman and Newport Muse for your outstanding work for your country, for our community, for our commonwealth, and for the cause of freedom. Now, President Bush and Mrs. Bush, first President Bush and Mrs. Bush, Governor Bush, Governor Kane, Senator Warner, fellow members of Congress, other distinguished guests, Sailors of the Navy, our finest Navy, ladies and gentlemen, patriots all, it is an invigorating and heartfelt honor to be with you all for this historic christening of this magnificent aircraft carrier. We gather today in honor 
and also for gratitude that will last forever to George Herbert Walker Bush for his lifetime of honorable service to the people of America. Because of his remarkable achievements through a lifetime of service, he joins other great presidents in having an aircraft carrier named after him, from George Washington to Teddy Roosevelt to Harry Truman to Ronald Reagan. This is a special day of celebration for a true gentleman, former President Bush, and for also for the brave men and women of the United States Navy who will, in time, set sail on this mighty beacon of peace and freedom. We cannot know at this moment, of time, in this moment in time what challenges and opportunities the crew will face in the seas ahead. But their mission and our mission as Americans are clear and timeless. Shortly before he became president in the summer of 1988, George H.W. Bush gave a soaring speech in which he said, I quote, I'm a man who sees life in terms of missions, missions defined and missions completed. Friends, the mission of our time is the same as it was for President Bush fighting in World War II or leading our country in winning the Cold War. Our mission is to protect our freedom in a sometimes hostile world. It is not an easy mission to be sure, but we will surely succeed because we believe, and rightly so, that the most powerful force in the world is the will and determination of a free people. And consistent with the life and demeanor of President George H.W. Bush, this carrier represents the kind, generous, and wholesome character of the American people. So ladies and gentlemen, patriots all, let us christen this magnificent ship with full confidence that while the 20th century America was the leader of the free world, in the 21st century America will be a leader of a world that is free. There are few men who better understand the importance of that mission than Admiral Michael Mullen, our Chief of Naval Operations, and it is my pleasure and honor to present him to you today. Admiral Mullen is a native of Los Angeles, California, who graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1948. He has held many commands, including Commander of the Joint Forces Command, U.S. Naval Forces Europe, which included the Balkans, Iraq, and the Mediterranean. His commands are a brilliant career of nearly 40 years. He became our nation's 28th Chief of Naval Operations in July of 2005. Please give a hearty welcome to Admiral Michael Mullen. I actually look like I graduated in 1968. <laughs> Senator Allen, thank you very much for that warm and kind introduction. President Bush, Mrs. Bush, thank you for being here. You honor us with your presence, and we greatly appreciate your leadership at this critical time in our nation's history. Mr. President, Mrs. Bush, thank you as well for sharing us, sharing with us, not only this day, but your great name. It stands for much. It stands for character and for strength. But as you well know, sir, having flown from the deck of the San Jacinto in combat, such a ship is not just a symbol of our power. It is a powerful symbol of our freedom. Today, this modern carrier for, named for you slips the ways and prepares to take up station in the fleet. She will find work and plenty of it as the fleet battles the enemies of freedom in places and in ways we never could have imagined just a few short years ago. It was, after all, an aircraft carrier we sent to New York Harbor on the 12th of September, 2001. An aircraft carrier that first struck back at the Taliban from the waters of the Indian Ocean. And an aircraft carrier with supporting ships that we dispatched to Indonesia in the wake of one of the most devastating natural disasters that nation or any nation has ever seen. Where will the George H.W. Bush go? What missions will she accomplish? We cannot know, but we do know that she will be, as her sister ships are today, the, the centerpiece of American sea power. 
I want to thank the talented men and women of Northrop Grumman Newport News for building her. This is, this is the only place in the world capable of producing one of these warships, and we are grateful to every one of you. I want to thank Mrs. Mrs. Doro Bush Cook for assuming a time-honored and deeply meaningful role in the lives of this ship and her crew. The George H.W. Bush will, with the smash of that bottle, inherit your spirit and take a piece of you with her wherever she sails and into whatever danger she faces. Thank you for standing by her. Your father knew, as you will come to know, that great warships are more than just decks and bulkheads, steel and stanchions. It is their crew that gives them the heart and soul. He once wrote about how the crew of San Jack taught him much about duty, true love, heartbreak, fear, and courage, and about the diversity of this great country. You will find that sailors still do. To Captain O'Flaherty, the crew of the Bush, and to your families, thank you for raising your hand and volunteering to serve. My charge to you is to bring this ship to life and make her a symbol of freedom. We are proud of you, and we expect a lot from you. I am proud to introduce our next speaker, a man who, like this ship's namesake, volunteered to serve in our Navy when the world was at war. And when that war was over, he continued to serve as a Marine Corps officer in Korea, as an assistant United States attorney, as a secretary of the Navy, and finally as the second longest serving U.S. Senator from the Commonwealth of Virginia. He's a man whose love of country is matched only by his love for those who defend it. As chairman or ranking member for 12 of his 28 years on the Senate Armed Services Committee, he has, in the words of one of his colleagues, addressed some of the most fundamental security issues facing this nation. I think it is fair to say that we would not be here standing before this great and wonderful new warship were it not for his leadership. He calls himself, as he did after casting his 10,000th vote in the Senate last May, the luckiest man you ever met. But I would say we, the men and women of the armed forces who bent it from his support, are the lucky ones. To us, particularly those of us in the Navy, he is more than a great senator, he is a shipmate. So allow me to introduce to you, if I may, electronics technician's mate third class, John W. Warner. President uh, George W. Bush and Laura Bush, President Bush and his lovely wife, Barbara, and Secretary Rumsfeld and all others who are present here today. It's a very moving and deeply humbling experience for me uh, to stand before you. I thank you, Admiral, for reference to my very modest service in World War II, simply as one of tens of thousands of young 17, 18 year olds in the closing year of the war, training to go abroad and uh, replace those who'd been on long and dangerous deployments. So we gather here today to honor one of America's greatest sons. And in doing so, Admiral, I first want to say that history will record the excellence of your stewardship of this United States Navy. Thank you, sir. As I look back on World War II, I acknowledge that I stand here today simply because of the magnificent training given to me by the Navy, the discipline, and the challenge to go forward in life and take my place. And I work with others in the Congress today to make sure that this generation of young men and women who proudly wear the uniforms of our service have not only the same but better opportunities than did my 
generation to achieve their dreams and aspirations. And that's been perhaps my greatest reward in these long years in the Senate, to work with the men and women of the armed forces. We gather here uh, on this memorable day to christen a ship. And as the Admiral said, the vital function to be performed momentarily, proudly and humbly by the President's daughter, Dora Bush Cook. When she strikes that bottle, she imparts her strength, her courage to that ship and its crew to protect it from the mystique and unknown perils of the sea. And ladies and gentlemen, only a woman can perform that task. <laughs> we do pause and recognize the service of what we call ships of the line, a phrase that's often used about our great capital ships. As they sail the seven seas, they're visible symbols of the nation, of the flag they proudly file from the mast. We view our ships of the line, particularly the mighty aircraft carrier, as an ambassador, as an island of America wherever it goes in the world on the seven seas, a symbol of our nation's determination to achieve peace, peace through strength. Now let's talk about the history of the naming of ships. I love naval history. And in preparation for this, I went back over all notes I had when I was Secretary of the Navy. And I remember so well, in our first ships, when we were a young, struggling republic, they were often named for living individuals. George Washington, Madison, and President Van Buren and others. Then the Navy saw the wisdom of taking away from the politicians the authority to name ships for living individuals. And for 174 years, that tradition persisted. Then early in the 1970s, a new team came to the Department of Defense headed by my dear friend and a dear friend of President Bush, Melvin Laird, together with a brash young Secretary of Navy. And we decided that we were going to change that system. And first and foremost, we were going to tackle Admiral Rickover, a very formidable individual whom I have everlasting respect and stop him from naming submarines for fish. <laughs> I remember a heated argument, and I was in the middle between Rickover and Laird when Rickover said, Admiral, fish don't vote, people do. <laughs> so we began to name submarines for the great cities. And then along came the Nimitz class of carriers. The Navy really has three masters. First and foremost, the sailors at Salem. Secondly, the commander in chief who issues the orders. And thirdly, the Congress of the United States that appropriates the money, not only for the ship, but for the crew and their families. So appropriately, the first two carriers were named number one for a sailor, Nimitz, Number two, for the Commander-in-Chief of Eisenhower. Now, how should we name number three? And Laird and I sat down, and we decided together to break the tradition and name it for a living individual, and we did so for Carl Vinson, a man who served 50 years, 50 years in the Congress of the United States and was recognized as the father of the Two Ocean Navy. So that's the history. And at this point, I think a message is being sent to me to stop this speech, <laughs> yield the platform, which I will do, and I'll put the rest of it in the record. 
to the Honorable <laughs> Secretary of the Navy, Don Winter, who's a man who brings extraordinary credentials from academia, from industry, and together with his family, totally devote yourselves to public service. Mr. Secretary, front and center, sir. Thank you, Senator. I have to say that working with Senator Warner is a true pleasure. As chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and as a former Secretary of the Navy, he does have a unique perspective, and he has been most open and generous in sharing it with me. I sincerely appreciate his wise counsel, his candor, and his personal efforts in supporting me as Secretary of the Navy. Thank you, sir, for your many years of support for the United States Navy and Marine Corps. Now today, we are greatly honored to be joined by our Commander-in-Chief, President George W. Bush. As our wartime leader during Operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom, President Bush has a profound appreciation for the unique value of aircraft carriers. Thank you, Mr. President, for personally showing your support for the United States Navy and all the men and women who serve in defense of our nation. It is an honor having you with us here today as we christen this magnificent warship, the USS George H.W. Bush. Named after the leader who entered the history books as an American hero at the age of 18, and who oversaw the end of the Cold War nearly half a century later, this ship will be called upon by future commanders-in-chief in times of crisis. President George Herbert Walker Bush is unique in having flown off an aircraft carrier as a young Navy pilot while also having turned to our aircraft carriers as wartime leader nearly 50 years later. America honors those who sacrifice, who lead, and who serve. President Bush will be honored for generations to come as a man who has never stopped serving his country and a leader who has earned the admiration and respect of a grateful nation. Thank you, sir, for being here this morning. Today, we are also joined by another former Navy pilot with a long and distinguished record of public service. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld has served at the highest levels of government for more than four decades. A former member of Congress, a lifelong advocate of naval power, and a believer in America's destiny as a beacon of freedom in the world, Secretary Rumsfeld brings an extraordinary background to the national security arena at a pivotal time in history. As a two-time Secretary of Defense, he is second to none in his experience and knowledge of defense matters. Secretary Rumsfeld is a doer. He energetically puts in 14-hour days, and that's on an easy day, not only because that is what he has always done, but because he is absolutely committed to the freedom of the United States and the security of the American people. He is a leader who is motivated solely by a desire to do the right thing, to serve the nation, and to do what is in America's national security interest. Ladies and gentlemen, our Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Donald Rumsfeld. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. President Bush and Mrs. Bush, and President Bush and Mrs. Bush, and all the members of the both Bush cabinets and administrations, it's wonderful to see you all. Governor Bush and Doral, members of the Bush family, Justice Thomas. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Pete Pace, and Chief of Naval Operation Mike Mullen, it's a privilege to serve with each of you. And to all the men and women in uniform here, thank you for your service as well. Governor Kane, Chairman Warner, Senator Allen, you know it's a, it is a real privilege, a high privilege, to be able to say a word about this mighty ship and the men whose name will proudly carry it across the high seas into victory. I might ask our 41st president, whom we honor today, a moment of indulgence to recognize someone here with a unique place in history. The descendant of a president, 
the wife of a president, the mother of a president, and the mother of two governors. Now that distinction does not just happen. It must take, I know it takes uncommon grace and wisdom, and it must also take stamina. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in honoring a wife, a partner, and to be sure, a historic figure in her own right, Mrs. Barbara Bush. We thank you for your service to our country and the example you have provided generations of Americans. Today we pay tribute to a man who from Navy Ensign to President has served our country with honor. For years to come, this 90,000 tons of military might, future generations will be reminded of President Bush's service and the in the almost 6,000 men and women who will man this vessel, they will see the kind of courage that inspired a young George Bush to volunteer for the Navy on his 18th birthday. Those traits of strength, love of country, are family hallmarks. We saw them in the distinguished senator from Connecticut, Prescott Bush. We saw them in the man we honor today. And we see those traits today in our president who has shown such courage and determination in our nation's time of peril. In times of great difficulty, character counts. And for those of us who are privileged to serve this president, we see that character, that grit, every single day to the great benefit of human freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a high honor to present our Commander-in-Chief, President George W. Bush. Thank you all. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Laura and I are honored to be here to honor our dad. We appreciate you coming. Mother, it's good to see you. <laughs> Members of the Bush family, all of you. Distinguished members of Congress, governor, ex-governors, the men and women of the United States Navy, military veterans, the workers who helped build this great ship. I join you, I know you join me in saying to our father, President Bush, your ship has come in. In a few minutes, my sister Dorothy will christen the newest and most advanced aircraft carrier in the Navy, the George H. W. Bush. For the pilots of the World War II generation who are with us today, this carrier may seem a little more inviting than the ones you landed on. As you can see, our Navy has made a few upgrades. George H.W. Bush is the latest in the Nimitz line of aircraft carriers. She is unrelenting. She is unshakable. She is unyielding. She is unstoppable. As a matter of fact, probably should have been named the Barbara Bush. <laughs> in accord with a long and honored tradition, we gather to christen this fine ship we recall the service and sacrifice of earlier generations, and we pay tribute to a new generation of sailors and Marines who step forward to serve in freedom's cause. George H.W. Bush is named for a man who exemplifies the great character of our country. On the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, George H.W. Bush was a teenager. He was a high school senior. Six months later, he was sworn into the Navy. A year later, he received his wings at a ceremony in, a ceremony in Corpus Christi, Texas. Here's what he said. He said, I had an ensign stripe and an admiral's confidence. I was a Navy pilot. 
Our dad would become known as one of the youngest, Navy's youngest pilots. But that wasn't his only distinction. While training along the Chesapeake Bay, the da da uh, pilots in our dad's flight class learned about a beach across the way where young ladies like to sunbathe. It became popular for the pilots to fly low over the beach. So one day, he came in low to take a look. It just so happened to be the same day the traveling circus had set up its tents. His dad's flyover upset an elephant causing him to break loose and make a run throughout the town. <laughs> he was called in for a reprimand from his commander. He puts it this way, I was grounded for causing an elephant stampede. <laughs> Probably the only Navy pilot in American history who can make that claim. <laughs> After training, he was assigned to a light carrier. He took part in the great turkey shoot of the Marianas. He knew the horror of kamikaze attacks. He would complete 58 combat missions. These were tough days. But he had something that kept him going, and if you look closely at the photographs of the planes he flew, you will find what kept him going and the name he had painted under his cockpit, Barbara. One of Dad's most important missions was a strike on a radio tower on an island called Chichijima. Japanese were using that tower to intercept U.S. military radio transmissions and alert the enemy about impending American airstrikes. September 2, 1944, his squadron was given a simple assignment to take it out. Pilots knew they would face heavy enemy fire because the Japanese had fortified the island. But Dad and his fellow pilots did their duty without complaint or hesitation. During that raid, his plane was hit by anti-aircraft artillery and it caught on fire. Yet he kept his plane on course. He released his four bombs and scored four direct hits on that tower. And he, he headed out to sea. He ejected. Japanese boats were sent out to capture him. After more than two harrowing hours at sea alone in a rubber life raft, he was rescued by the crew of the USS Finback. For his action, he earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. Yet it is characteristic that from those moments aboard his life raft to this ceremony today, Dad's thoughts have always been of the two fine members of his crew who did not make it home. Radio man, second class, John Delaney, and Lieutenant J.G. Ted White. On that day over Chichijima, a young American became a war hero and learned an old lesson. With the defense of freedom comes loss and sacrifice. George H. W. Bush honors a generation that valued service above self. Like so many who served in World War II, duty came naturally to our father. In the four years of that war, 16 million Americans would put on the uniform. And the human costs were appalling. From the beaches of Normandy to the jungles of Southeast Asia, more than 400,000 Americans would give their lives. From the beginning of that war, there were those who argued that freedom had seen its day, and that the future belonged to the hard men in Tokyo and Berlin. Yet the war machines of Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany would be brought down by American GIs who only months before had been students and farmers and bank clerks and factory hands. The generation of World War II taught the world's tyrants a telling lesson. There is no power like the power of freedom and no soldier as strong as a soldier who fights for a few free future for his children. George H.W. Bush will serve as a new generation of Americans, every bit as brave, as selfless as those who've come before him. 21st century, in the 21st century, freedom is a, again under attack. And young Americans are volunteering to answer the call. 
In the years since September the 11th, 2001, more than 1.6 million Americans have volunteered to wear the uniform of the United States. Today, they serve in distant lands and on far seas, from the islands of Southeast Asia to the Horn of Africa, to the mountains of Afghanistan and in Iraq. And once again, with perseverance and courage and confidence in the power of freedom, a new generation of Americans will leave a more hopeful and peaceful world for generations to come. The men and women of the United States military represent the best of America, and they deserve the best America can give them. And the George H.W. Bush is the best America can give them. During his time in the South Pacific, Ensign Bush served on a light carrier called the USS San Jacinta. That ship was named for the 1836 Battle of San Jacinta. And in that battle, the Free Texas Forces, led by Sam Houston, defeated a Mexican army that was much larger in size. And Sam Houston succeeded in capturing the Mexican general responsible for the slaughter of the Alamo just a few weeks before. And on the eve of the battle, the outcome was far from certain. And the Mexicans seemed to hold the advantage. So Sam Houston called his Texans together. And he reminded them what they were fighting for. He told them, be men, be free men, that your children may bless their father's name. On this proud day, the children of George H.W. Bush blessed their father's name. The United States Navy honors his name. And the ship that bears his name sails into this young century as a symbol of American strength and freedom. May God watch over all those who sail this ship, all those who fly from her, their deck, and all those at home who pray for their safe return. My honor to bring to you the 41st president, a great dad, George H.W. Bush. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank all of you. Mr. President. Mr. President, thank you, sir, for that very kind, wonderfully generous introduction. And to say that I'm pleased to be here is a classic understatement of the year. This is any naval aviator's dream come true. I first want to salute every single shipbuilder who has pitched in to make this vessel what you see today and which will finish, finish it off in time for commissioning uh, in 2008. This is magnificent. And these shipbuilders are the best that the United States could possibly have, and I salute every single one of you. I'd say this is the happiest day in my life, but I remember saying that after both Jeb and George were elected governor on the same day. I was flying home to Houston from, from Florida, and I said to Barbara, this is the happiest day in my life. And she said, what about the day we're married? I said, that was a nice day, too. So anyway, I, I would simply have to say that this is uh, maybe the third happiest day in my life. But, but uh, I, 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 there's much to be added to what's been said. I salute every platform guest here. Uh, and all of you, I thank all of you, my friends who came from all around the world, my former cabinet members, the people who counseled me uh, when we had to go into battle uh, back, in, back in the 90s. And all in all, it's a great day in my life. Uh, the, the United States Navy made a man, or started to make a man, out of a very scared 18-year-old kid. Uh, but I got to set the record straight, because Tom Brokaw wrote a magnificent book talking about World War II guys as the greatest generation. Uh, in my humble view, we were no greater than the kids that serve today. All volunteer, all fighting.
We're very proud of those who are serving. After our nation was attacked at Pearl Harbor, you sim could, simply couldn't find anyone who wasn't anxious to sign up. And uh, like so many Americans, Barbara, that you've heard much about today, became a riveter there at the Russell Butzel and Ward Nut Company in Porchester, New York. She was good. The point is, our nation was, that's true. The point is that our nation was, was totally united against the insidious totalitarian threat against freedom. And what had been a sleepy mercantile nation suddenly became a major industrial producer of needed armaments, the arsenal of democracy, as FDR called it. And like millions, I worked my way through basic training, and I went to war flying off the 71.5-foot-wide deck converted cruiser USS San Jacinto. Uh, I had the name of Barbara. Uh, you're, you're allowed to do it in those days. I don't know whether the Navy lets it now, but uh, written on the side of my uh, Grumman torpedo bomber. Uh, as an officer, I remember I had to read the outgoing mail. Uh, we had to censor the mail of all the shipmates, and I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about human nature. I learned a lot about the hearts and dreams of these, of these kids. And I would see these letters written, and I'd count my own blessings. Thank goodness, in a practical sense, I was flying that slow, and steady TBF, the easiest plane to fly if you had to land on a carrier. And uh, the deck was 70 foot wide compared to this. You can't picture it. Uh, it was not the easiest target to hit in rough seas. So I've always been grateful to Grumman, which has been a part of this outfit uh, for this marvelous plane. Uh, once I, I was waved off, uh, I couldn't find a couldn't land, the guy, landing signal officer waved me off and I had to go around. I landed up in front of the fleet with four to 500 pound depth charges in the bottom of the pl plane. And uh, I was hoping the damn things wouldn't go off, I'll tell you. But thankfully the 80 aircraft and airmen who fly off these decks will hopefully have more room to hit the deck of the CVN-77 with its 4.5 acre landing field. Uh, on September 2nd, uh, my plane did get shot down, as the President said. Uh, president Kennedy, Kennedy was asked how he became a war hero. He said, they sank my boat. Well, I became a war hero, they shot my plane down. A lot of guys were better, didn't get shot down, and they didn't become heroes. I don't understand it. I've never considered myself a hero anyway. But uh, I'm very glad that four of our my pilots with whom I flew in Air Group 41 are here. Jack Guy, who won the Navy Cross, uh, Stan Butchard is here, Je Lou Grab from California, and Blackie Adams, a fighter pilot uh, from Idaho. They all came here for this. this. <laughs> it's been 62 years since those traumatic days in the Pacific, but it's also been 61 years since the Blessed Union with a wonderful woman and all the blessings and everything else that has followed. Uh, I am very proud of our president. I support him in every single way with every fiber in my body. <clears throat> it, seems, it seems surreal that you could go from being a young naval aviator, then surviving a horrible war, then losing an innocent child and having some modest success in business, then rising through the killing fields of national politics in present, to be president. And after four thoroughly, thoroughly challenging years as president, it would be even more improbable to see your own two sons rise to become a respected national leaders. They see, see nothing uh, of, the, of the private success of our three other kids. Uh, I am truly blessed as a dad. And so today, speaking strictly as parents, uh, for Barbara and me, our cup runneth over. The Daro is the sponsor of this ship. I just can't tell you what pride I have in that and how much joy that gives to me. I can't wait to see this remarkable state-of-the-art vessel go to sea. And when it does, I want to get permission from the Commander-in-Chief uh, to be on board. I'm finishing, Lord. I'm finishing. Don't worry about it. Whatever happens, I hope the American people accept my deepest gratitude for the chance to serve this nation
and an honor that touches deep in my heart. Thank you very, very much. I think we're going to get on with this. <laughs> Thank you, President Bush. It's, it's, it's such an honor for all of you to be with us today and take part of this event. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost that time you've been waiting for the christening of the ship. I have the pleasure of introducing to you the ship sponsor. Doro Bush Cook is no stranger to Northrop Grumman Newport News. I already mentioned her role as Matron of Honor in 1990 at the christening of CVN 73 USS George Washington. Since being named ship sponsor for CVN 77, she has taken a very active role, visiting the ship, shipbuilders, and crew several times, and we couldn't be more delighted. Doro, her mother Barbara, and her matron of honor, her sister-in-law Patricia Riley Cook, are all advocates of family literacy. So it is only fitting that when we asked Doro to contribute to a time capsule for this ship, she gave us page proofs from her book, My Father, My President, which was just published yesterday. In addition to her involvement with the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, Doro serves on the board for the National Rehabilitation Hospital in Washington, D.C. The hospital specializes in treating people with various neurological and orthopedic conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the sponsor for the aircraft carrier, George H.W. Bush, Mrs. Doro Bush Cook. Thank you. Thank you. Two years ago, President Carter, another Navy man, gave a very generous assessment of my father's life when he said dad had had a career of service to this country that is almost unmatched in history. As a soldier, an administrator, a diplomat, vice president, and president of the United States. And just a few months before that, the, pre the former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, said that of all the foreign leaders he worked with during the twilight years of the Cold War, President George Herbert Walker Bush was the very best. But I am very proud to stand here before you today, not only as the sponsor of this remarkable ship but also on behalf of my brothers, to suggest that today we are honoring a devoted father, a faithful husband, and the world's greatest grandfather. There's something reassuring to me in the knowledge that over the next half century, the thousands of men and women who are deployed aboard this ship will become familiar with dad and his singular life. As they do, they will not only learn about a great statesman, but also an innately decent human being. I'm biased, of course, but no friend was ever more loyal, no father ever more caring. Being asked to serve as the sponsor of CVN 77 is the greatest gift ever conferred upon me. I will always honor my responsibilities in this special role, and I would like to join my father, my brother, my family, in saluting not only the men and women who built this remarkable ship, but also the courageous men and women who will soon man it. They make us all proud to be Americans. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doro. Now, if you would join me and President George H.W. Bush and President George W. Bush on the bottle break stand, we will christen this ship.
Christen the United States ship George H. W. Bush. May God bless all who sail her. What an ending. Thank you so much, Dr. Tynan, for that beautiful finale. And thanks so much, Doro, for being such a wonderful and gracious sponsor. And thanks to our ship's namesake, President George H.W. Bush, and to your family for being here on this great day for Northrop Grumman, for our Navy, and for America. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all for coming. Have a good day.
If everyone could please remain in their places until the departure of the two presidents. Thank you.